other, even though it's virtual, but we're here and we're here together. And I'm glad to see your faces. So I want to scroll around and see everyone. Some of you I haven't seen, and we have people from far and near. So welcome, welcome. Um, let's, let's see. Uh, uh, Karuna, are you here? Oh, there you uh -oh. are. Right. <laughs> let's just have a land acknowledgement so that I can get myself grounded and we can get started, OK? All right, sweet. So hello, my name is Karuna and I'm from the YC, the Youth Empowerment Committee. And today I would like to honor the people whose lands we live on, um, the Molala, the Cayuse, the Tualatin Kalapuya, the Willamette Tumwater, the, William, um, the Wasco Wishram, and the Clackamas Chinook and the other Chinook people of the Willamette area. We must acknowledge them as the original inhabitants of the land and recognize we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. It is in our place and duty to honor the original people and their continued stewardship of the land that makes up this community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's just take about five seconds to digest that and think about where we are and who was here before us and the, the story, the story of what happened to those people and their land. And so while we sit here, just know that some folks before us paid a big price for us to have this place. Well, last month, um, I was in a very emotional time celebrating um, the anniversary of my mother's birthday. And then we talked about women and celebrating women for a month. And I was feeling pumped about celebrating women. Just, I wanted to talk about women. And then I saw something, I saw a picture of someone that I know. And this person was recognized. She was nominated. And can we find this person and put her on the screen for me? Uh, John, can you find her? Or our other Pat? I just want to just want to get her there. Anyway, I'll have her say do, something. Do you want to do you want to Spotlight her? Is that what you want yes, to do? Yes, I want to spotlight her. I want her to pop out so we'll know who we're talking about. So John has to do it. Okay. So while you're doing that, there, oh, there we she go. Is. <laughs> so this is Denise Milholland. And I probably said the name wrong, but I was trying anyway, Denise. <laughs> and she's my friend, and I apologize. But Denise was honored. I saw her picture as one of the <laughs> phenomenal women. And this was done by the Oregon Women's Health Network. And so we want to not let you know, oh my goodness, I got a little uh, bit about her background and I said, oh my goodness, we have somebody here that's a high, high. She spent 30 years in corporate America and the public sector. She's done all things. She's traveled to 30 different countries. She is the board secretary of the nonprofit Good in the Hood Multicultural Festival that's held in Portland. And this is its 29th year. And she is working, working, working as the chairperson of the parade on the, oh, she's just doing a lot. And she had a chance to go through the leadership, Lake Oswego leadership class, leadership Lake Oswego. I should know the right name of it, but I don't right now. And she is one of our own. And we want to say congratulations. She is a phenomenal woman. She's organized. She is great. And she has all these skills and she's one of us. So let's give her a big hand clap. 
<laughs> Thank Surprise! <you. laughs> I wasn't expecting this, obviously. So thank you so much. Thank I said surprise. I was trying to figure out how we could do this. <laughs> so very much. We had joys, and we also had sad moments. We had sad moments when a young man decided that he would murder two people just because of their ethnicity, of who they were. And so we had the gunman who killed eight Asian people in Georgia that made all of us sad. It made us feel it was something that we felt across this country to know that because uh, one of our leaders, former leaders, decided to say something very negative about our Asian people. And that person, unfortunately, gave other people the right to say and to do people, do things, to harm people, to hit, to hurt, to spit at, to do just mean things to our Asian American and Pacific, Pacific Island people. And we want you to know that as we respond to racism, we are standing in solidarity with you against the hate, against all of the mistreatment that you are getting. We joined with Lake Oswego, it's Elo for Love for what was supposed to be a silent march. And that did happen. But before the march, there were people, Asian American people, uh, adults and young people sharing their stories of what has happened to them being here in this the great United States of America. And you know what? I said, we've been treating people badly as long as we've been here. And it continues and it continues and it continues. And we have to break it. We have to interrupt it. And I am hoping that as we, with our small group here, start to do the work that we are going to make a difference so that the students won't have to tell the stories. We heard from our Asian students the same things we've heard from our Black students of things, how mean kids can be and the things that they say to you. But our adults are also suffering. And they're suffering because there has been a a change in the, the, well, I can't say it's a change because people have been this way mean all the time, but they're just doing it more openly and that has to stop. So there's no place for hate here and we have to interrupt it. We have to step up, we have to speak up and you don't put yourself in harm's way. Don't be crazy, but you take a stand on things and stand with us we as an organization will stand against it, march with us. Because when I looked at that silent march that they had in the rain, people walked and thought about and prayed about and reflected on the good, the bad and the ugly, but hopefully they were more of the good of what it could be. And they did it in the rain. No one said a word. It was in the rain that we said, there's no place for hate. And we are standing with our Asian American and Pacific Islanders against hate. So join us, please, if you're not with us. So let me just start getting my papers together here and tell you Respond to racism. Our mission, and we started just three and a half years ago, is to educate 
and empower the Lake Oswego residents and institutions with the tools to combat racism in all its forms and make Lake Oswego and Oregon a better place to live for residents of all races and ethnicities. And uh, while we started out to do it for Lake Oswego, our work has touched other cities and we have people. We're just like, it's spreading all out. And, and when I hear it and see it, I'm amazed in three years, how much and what we've done and what a difference it's made. But for our meeting tonight, I want to share the agreements that we came up with a long time ago, and we're still keeping our agreements and our expected outcomes. We want you to speak from your own experiences tonight. We've all had different experiences, and so you use an I statement. Please don't tell someone else's story. And please don't generalize someone else's experiences while you're talking. Listen with full presence, curiosity, and openness to others' perspectives. Ask clarifying questions. If you don't understand, ask clarifying questions. Assume the best intent. And sometimes you have to lean in to discomfort. I mean, you have to sit with that discomfort for a little while. And sometimes you have to challenge your own biases. So quietly do that. Sometimes there are oops. And sometimes there's an ouch. The oops, when you say something, oops, I shouldn't have said that. But, and then there's an ouch. When someone has said something that sort of, you know, I used to say when I was growing up, the little said that someone stepped on your foot or stepped on your toe, that meant something that hurt a little bit or it wakes you up, may stimulate a little bit of pain in ourselves and others. And I ask that you take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. So we want you to step up, step back if you talk too much like I do, and give, listen. Listen more if you tend to talk a lot. Our expected outcomes, you'll get acquainted with people. We're gonna be breaking out into breakout groups and you'll get acquainted with people, not exactly like we did in person, but let's use this, this um, platform to our best advantage. We won't solve all the problems. We're not gonna solve all, we're not solving racism in two hours. You'll leave the meeting maybe with some questions or maybe you'll leave with an aha moment. You'll have one actionable item and you might have to think about it. But before you leave this meeting, think about one thing that you heard, one thing that you were feeling that, you know, I could do X, Y, and Z myself. So think of one thing that you can do. And you'll have more ideas about how you can interrupt racism. So listen and have a great time doing that. But I'm not finished talking yet. You have a lot to listen to me tonight. I apologize. But we sent out um, a letter. And it was a fundraising letter. And that fundraising letter um, went to some people. And we don't know what happened. So we're sending out the second letter. And we are looking for you to please read it and to help us out. We are a nonprofit. You have a lot of volunteers here who are working full time, sometimes overtime, to help respond to racism. And it's great. 
I mean, it was great. We are greeting um, different people. We're meeting people. And I'm encouraged and want to just take a moment just to think about how far we've come. Those of you who've been with us from the beginning, when we first started to talk about racism, when we sat down as a church with our 66 people, and we sat there and just with most people were just amazed that there was a racist incident that happened in Lake Oswego. And then we started talking and people started realizing that things, things are happening here. There is racism in Lake Oswego. There is systemic racism. But I can sit here with a smile on my face tonight and tell you I am so, so happy because in three years, things have changed. There's people all over the city that are working on making Lake Oswego a better place for everyone. Whether you live here or you pass through here or you work here, that we want you to have a good experience. We want to see more variety here, but we want to welcome everyone. And so we ask that um, you join us. If you live near and you're not, if you're on this call, and you don't live here, come on by, check us out. And if you have a good experience, you can tell us about it. If you have a bad experience, and I hope you don't, um, you let us know that, let me know. Anyway, um, we've done a lot of things. Oh God, from book clubs all over the city, discussion groups, we've had letter writing, we had training on how to write letters to the editor. We had trainings uh, right now. There are trainings, I think it's the third Sunday. I can't remember, but so check, check the website. But there is a letter writing for our young people. Um, and if you're young in heart, you can join them too. If you need some help with writing and proofreading, um, they're learning how to write their own papers, but also how to write and advocate for something. And so that kind of information is so helpful. And we have volunteers who are there willing to proofread and to teach you how to write. Um, we've had protests and vigils, and we've gone to our city uh, officials. We've had many, many meetings. And so we're on board now where we meet with uh, uh, the mayor once a one month. It's on this calendar. We have time. We can go to our city councilors and they listen to us. That's the important part. They listen to us. And so we're making a difference in the city. Um, the DEI advisory committee that is a permanent uh, part of one of the boards of the city council's boards and committees. And that's work that wasn't in the place when we started. The city is going to be hiring, they've announced now, a DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, manager here, program manager to look at the city operations. And that's different. Our school districts, District Edu uh, Equity and uh, Inclusion Committee started after we started responding to racism. I got a call from someone and they, I was invited to dinner. And then the whole thing was to have a conversation about, well, what do you think about a committee to talk about these things? The, the school district has a teacher who's on special assignment, who prepares lessons and she does all kinds of trainings and provides materials for our teachers. And if there are some parents, she meets with parents to yet tell and listen and also to let them tell them what's going on so that they'll know and you'll know what to, to look for. These things weren't happening back there in 2017 when we started. 
they were not happening. And so I'm happy there are churches doing things that's happening all over the city and I am happy about it. But it also requires a lot of work. You need volunteers and I'm gonna be looking out here and saying, okay, we need someone who can help us. And if you wanna volunteer and you have any special talents, will you please put something in the chat and we will look and cut up the information when we're finished and we will contact you. If you're interested in volunteering, uh, we need somebody, some folks. We have grants that we're uh, applying for. We got a $30,000 grant in, uh, in December, but we're looking for more grants because we need to hire someone that can run the day-to-day -day work. Um, I can't go to every meeting and neither can the other people on the leadership team. And we're trying to spread ourselves too thin and we need to have some paid help that we can help have. And it could be contract help. If this is a business that you already run and you want to contract with us, you think you have something to offer us, you know, let us know and we will check you out, but we need money to do it. So I'm getting around to this whole thing. I'm talking, talking, talking all about it, but I'll we'll send something out in writing instead of listening to me. But what I would like for you to know is that we applied for another grant. We won't know until May whether or not we were able to get it. <clears throat> but on the grant, we put down that we were going to be raising $30,000 on our own. And $30,000 for us is a lot of money. And then if you are so want to do it and you have the money and you can want to play a lot of it, uh, give us a lot of it, rather. You're not paying, you're giving us money. We are 501c3, but we're asking for money. And I guess I don't do it very well when I beg for money, but I am asking you to, to uh, make a donation. Some of you have told us that these meetings, you look forward to them, they have changed your life. We need money to keep on doing it. And so if you want to miss, make a donation, you want to do it on a monthly basis, and the regular basis, we still have a, a connection with our church, the church, the Lake Oswego United Church of Christ. And that, that is the church. It's not a church activity. They happen to embrace us and, and work, but they're helping us out. But there is a, we have a line there for you to budget, for you to pay, to donate. And if you want to set it up where you say, I want to give $10 a month, or I want to give $100 a month. It doesn't matter how much. If you want to just give it and give it to us so that we can plan our budget and our activities. Um, if you don't want to do it that way and you just want to write a check, um, you can write a check and I will put the address in the chat for you to, con uh, for you to copy. So the information will be in the chat for you. But we're looking forward, looking forward to it. And I'm looking forward to you having a wonderful, wonderful night. Okay, now that I've talked you to sleep, let me take a little poll. Are you ready, John, for poll? We'll I think up. so. Okay, so this is a short one. He's gonna put a poll up give us a little response. And then while he's doing that, I want to just say thanks to all the people who have helped us. Uh, our city council meeting, going there, look at listening, the people listening. While I'm talking, you can do your poll. It's three, it's one of those things. So if you first timer, two to six times or seven to 12 times in the past year attended a meeting. We we're just checking to see who's in the room. Um, the protesters, the follow-up to our fundraising letter, 
if you made a donation or you plan to make a donation, I want to thank you. And then I have a right hand person that I just have to thank. And that's May Kadim. I did not pronounce that right and I apologize. apologize. Um, May, but May has been the one to write our grants to um, be our right, my right hand. And I appreciate her so much. And I want to give Public thanks to her for all that she gives. She believes in our work and she is putting herself, her whole mind, body, and soul into helping respond to racism. And thank you, May, so much. All right, poll finish. Is it finished? Yes, it yep. does. Okay. So our next Thing. Oh, there's a results, Willie, on our poll. Oh, there we go. So, wow, 18% for the first time, 32% who had two between two and six times, and 50% of you have been here seven to 12 times in the past year. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on, come, keep on coming. If it's a first time, um, Come back. Okay. And I want to give a shout out to um, one of the um, newcomers tonight. Um, she's one of Ada's um, Lewis and Clark friends. Her name is, um, look at here now, um, Chao Ying. And she is a Fulbright student from Taiwan teaching um, Chinese. So oh, welcome. Wow. And I think she'd also invited a friend that. Oh. Uh, so. Hi there. Welcome. 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 Thank you for me. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, that's a good model there, Ada. Invite a friend. Okay. All right. Let's see. Pat, I've done everything. You have another poll? Um, before I do another poll, I think Kathy um, Lloyd had an announcement. Oh, okay. Kathy? So I would just like to let everyone know that um, our amazing Willie Poinsett, who's one of the most humble, hardworking, and effective people I know in our town, won a Service Above Self Educator Excellence Award from the Lake Oswego Rotary. And yeah, so um, as part of her, she was a, she's a community. Every year, the, the Lake Oswego Rotary gives uh, awards to people in our city who demonstrate service above self. And I can't imagine anyone other than William Poinsett winning this award. And as part of this award, a $3,000 scholarship will go to a high school student from either oh, Lake Ridge High great. School or Lake Oswego High School in Willie Poinsett's name. So Willie, we love you and we thank you for everything that you do. And um, we are all celebrating this award that you've won from our Lake Oswego Rotary Club. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's an honor. And I'm so excited that students can get a scholarship. That makes me happy. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, our next poll. You have me doing all the polls, Pat. You're the okay. president. You're going to do the next one? <laughs> All right, the next poll. We're going to see what kind of activities you've done over the last month. So you'll get a poll, and it's going to say you've read or you're reading Cast or Warmth of Other Sun. You've co continued the discussion of America's caste system about some things, for example, redlining. Um, you have examined the role systemic racism plays in your life. Um, that means you've given it a little thought there. You've reached out to a BIPOC, Black Indigenous people or, or people of color led equity group and asked how you can best support them. And you followed through with it. 
you've attended either the city council or the Lake Oswego policing listening session that they had for citywide. Or you took an action that's not listed and you don't have to tell us what you did. You just have to say, I did something. So go for it. Do the poll. Looks like most everyone has voted really. Okay. And you want to tell us the results? And while that's happening, I'm going to tell you what's it, what you're in for tonight. I've talked longer than I was supposed to. Okay, tonight we have a person that I love. Oh, the poll is up. Okay. All right, Pat, you can do the poll. Oh, um, okay. Um Thank you all for, um, looks like everyone is just, the community is just doing like so much work. Um, and I mostly appreciate that you continue to examine the role systemic racism plays in your life and in your community. So even though the list is very long, um, as long as you're participating in any one of these, um, you know, our hats off to you. Um, so thank you so much for making Lake Oswego, you know, a better place to live. Thank you. Okay. You're in for a treat tonight. We have Catherine Phelps. And Catherine has been here, uh, I'm totally off script, but she is the one who does our story time. And if you have a young child or a grandchild, or you just want to listen and watch what happens. Young at heart. The, <laughs> young at heart. If you're young at heart and she... I mean, she did one tonight and I thought it was just awesome about architects. A little girl started out who wanted to be an architect and how she went through the book. And what I'm so excited about is that the kids who are listening to her, to her read, or they have a reader, a guest reader, but listening are developing such a, a great language the words and I thought about kids that I used to teach or I was principal at a school and there were kids who had no idea what these words meant. And I thought, wow, if only they had a Catherine Phelps there, mm -hmm. Ms. Phelps, who was teaching them, or if they've had that experience before entering school or while they're in elementary school. So it's so exciting. So if you have any young people they start at five, it's only for a half an hour, from five to 5.30 before our meetings. And so if you want to go to our website and learn a little bit more. But Catherine, if I tell you about her, she has a bachelor's in family studies from the University of Maryland and a master's degree in education from New York University. And early in her teaching career, she taught in New York City public schools and at an international school in Tianjin, China. Shortly after her second year of working in China, Catherine moved to Israel for 10 years of work at the Baha'i World Center in Haifa, Israel, joining an international staff of over 70 countries, from over 70 countries. During her 10 years in Haifa, she did a part-time work there while raising her young family, assisting with research and writing in its secretariat uh, department, editing work with the archives department and administrative work in her legal office. While serving there, she helped to organize a number of community projects centered around early childhood education, literacy and community building with a particular focus on families with young children and after returning to the United States, she went back to classroom teaching and she taught in Washington and actually here in LO. And she recently started her own small business, which is tutoring practice focus on helping young readers develop their reading skills. Since, since September, she has been a small and dedicated part of a small and dedicated team 
of Respond to Racism members that puts together the virtual monthly read aloud program for young children. We are so excited to have her. She has a heart of gold and she is so well versed in so many subjects and the areas of teaching and working with children. I am so pleased that we are so lucky. She's one of our own who is here tonight to talk with us about how to raise a child, an anti-racist child. You know, in this environment, what do you do? Kids start learning these things so very early in their development that they can see differences and how do you make, you know, those differences as assets and not something that we don't want. And so tonight, Catherine, I want you to just be with us and we'll be with you as you share some of your information. Um, I have to say one thing I didn't say about this. I saw Catherine uh, doing a presentation at the L.O. Reads for parents. And I said, you know, our parents and grandparents could benefit from this. And so here she is tonight. And with not anything else, I hope, Pat, did I cover everything? And Catherine can finally get on. Yes. <laughs> so I guess for tonight, who is a member of our group, Catherine Phelps, Take it away. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here. And congratulations to Denise and Willie. All praise to these beautiful women doing so much for us. Um, I am going to be sharing tonight um, a presentation on, let me share my screen here. On raising up socially conscious anti-racist communities for our children. And um, there are just gonna be sort of five different parts to our time together. So first we'll have a video presentation and then um, we'll break out into small groups, into breakout rooms and have small group discussion. The facilitators will share some questions um, with the group and have everyone discuss them. Then we'll come back together and we'll have a whole group share. So if there are any highlights or insights from that small group, we'll share them together then. And then I'll share with you some highlights from a research article that I um, read not too long ago to give us insights on how children learn race, but also how we should approach um, talking about race with children. And then I'll share a few action steps because this is something respond to race, racism community is really big about is finding ways in between our time together to, to act on things so that we feel a momentum and we're doing our part as individuals for the collective whole. So the first thing I'll share with you is a video presentation. It's from uh, 2012, but I was really amazed. And this article was that I found too, because I was trying to research this is also from about uh, 19 years ago, but I'm always shocked at how relevant and timely they are. Um, and certainly the research um, hasn't uh, changed all that much in this area. But this video presentation um, that we'll be discussing is looking at um, race and how children learn about race. And after we watch the video presentation, the discussion that I'll, the questions that I'll have this was facilitators talk with you about are these two questions. What insights about race, uh, about children and race, did you learn from the video? And then I'd also like you to talk about the question, why do you think some parents avoid talking about race and racism with children? So let me start off by sharing this video and let me optimize the sound. Okay. Thank you so much. 
Um, so we wanted to see if there were any um, anything anyone wanted to share from the small group discussions, any highlights that anyone wanted to share from their group? Thank you, Sara. Hi. Um, so when I was talking to my group, I was thinking a lot because, you know, I'm not that far away from my childhood. Some would say it's still my childhood. Um, and whenever I talk about race with my peers, we, I always hear the same excuse from uh, white kids. Um, it's, I'm colorblind, I don't see color. Um, we were talking about that in the breakout room, that um, general excuse for being um, racist or whatever they might excuse themselves for. I feel like race is a big part of some people's identity and to say that you don't see that kind of diminishes them. So mm -hmm. I wanted to add to that because mm -hmm. I, feel, I feel like that should be talked about more. Thank you so much, Sara. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other shares mm -hmm. from the whole group? Kristen? Um, I would like to say something that I thought we concluded in our group that was very enlightening. But first, I'd like to respond. I don't. I couldn't see the name of who was just speaking. Um, but I also want us to recognize that at any one time, there are several different identities operating in a person. Um, and denying the existence of any one of those identities is like erasing them as a person. Um, and unless there's an open acknowledgement of who that person is fully, it's like you're erasing part of their past and part of their experience. And so I just feel like it's important to keep race and all the components of somebody's identity in, in mind when talking to them. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you for sharing that. Any other thoughts? Yes, I, I'd like to add to that also, the last uh, respondent. We, we do see color and we, because it, it's, if there's a difference there, it's called we discriminate. And the problem is that discrimination has been given a negative connotation. Um, we, when we want something for our birthday, we ask for it we we, because we discriminated on what we want. Through discrimination, we can uh, satisfy our wants and needs as well as turn it in a negative direction. And I think that and we need to understand that, that difference. You can discriminate, but it doesn't have to hurt someone. It doesn't have to cut into their identity or diminish them the way it often does. Perhaps we need a new word, something that's more accurate for what's going on. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I wanted to also raise one for something for thought. Um, if you deny the truth, and deny someone's reality, then you diminish trust. And without trust, there's no moving forward. So I think that's another reason why it's important to be honest, certainly with a care for the other person's feelings, but to actually be honest. Otherwise, you know, by by not being, you know, by being disingenuous with others that's gonna make other people feel unsafe and not heard. So you need to set up a, an atmosphere of trust and that means honesty. So you can say mm -hmm. how you feel, but you, know, you can also qualify it. You can say to a person, you know, this isn't personal. I'd like to say this, is it okay? You ask permission rather mm -hmm. than denying and, and basically lying. So those are the other things that we can do to promote inter-ethnicity communication and creating a safe space for it. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. I saw Jan, Beth, Jan and then Beth, I think. Sure. Um, oops, uh, am I? Oh, you're on there. There I go. There, there I go. go. Okay. <laughs> Hit the right button. Um, in, in, in our group, the, the second question, why do you think some parents avoid talking about race? Um, a, a general consensus was that uh, people felt that 
white adults are uncomfortable talking about race, especially to young kids and um, uncomfortable talking about slavery and concentration camps. And um, one of the, the main reasons uh, people said was because they don't wanna say the wrong thing and because they don't have enough information. And so then they just don't say anything. And uh, one of the younger people in our group said she really wished that they would have those conversations and allow those conversations to, to happen, especially in school. Thank you, Jan. Mm -hmm. Beth, did you have your hand up? Oh. Yeah, I was just gonna ask um, Pam Rossio to speak for a second and from our group, because we talked a lot about the importance of schools and just kind of the, how they can play a support role for parents. Like if you have training, helping parents to have those conversations. And then Pam had an interesting experience with um, having, actually I'll just have her tell it. Pam, can you um, yeah. chime in? Um, well, at my school, um, we have, uh, we ha I'm a retired teacher, but we had probably about 48% Hispanic children. And um, so they were really concerned about how to really help them read. And so they came up with the idea of let's really separate them out and only teach them in Spanish and the rest of the kids in English. And what I noticed, it totally changed the culture of the school because the kids were separated all the time. I mean, that was their big core. And so then they weren't mixing at recess and, and at lunchtime, they weren't sitting together. And it, I mean, it, I don't think that it made a really big difference in their reading scores, but it really made a huge difference in the culture of the school by separating out the kids. So. Thank you for sharing. We'll take um, a couple more. Uh, there was Kathy and Zoe had their hand up and then Mina. Zoe's our spokesperson. I do, Zoe, if it's okay, I do wanna jump in and maybe this is what you're gonna say, but um, we were just talking about how families, white families are worried about saying the wrong thing or when to start speaking about things. And I think one of the things that came up in our group was that um, if you're a member of a marginalized community, you start having that conversation before kindergarten. And so, you know, or at least at kindergarten. And so, um, and there's no concern about, am I gonna say the wrong thing? Because it's, it's something that has to be um, addressed and spoken to. And so I think that for our, our group was saying that for our um, white, parents and members here that um, saying, you know, using that as an excuse, well, I, I, I'm just gonna wait. There are folks in our community that don't wait. That, that conversation starts at age four, age five. And so that was one thing that was brought up in our group. And then Zoe, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Um, so I just wanted to um, talk about what we talked about in our group. And we talked about how, um, Um, yeah, okay. Um, so why people don't talk about racism in their families is um, basically what um, Kathy said about um, like uh, people being afraid that they're gonna mess it up. And I also thought that maybe um, parents were um, were trying to like, protect their children um and um just like not talk about racism to try to protect their children so. thank you for sharing zoe mina and then xiao ying uh, one of the things um i'm a white mother of children of color and um so not only are um, white people afraid to talk about it, but I think it's really important that we never learned about it. Our schools never taught us anything about what to say or anything. Uh, the only thing I think I remember learning about slavery, and this was on the Oregon coast uh, where I went to school, is that many of the slave owners were very nice to their slaves. Mm. 
and that's all that I, you know, um, the other, I think the other big issue is that families that are uh, families of color, they deal with it every day. And, you know, uh, it's, it's when uh, it's white families, you know, we get the book and we read it to our kids and, you know, we may talk about it every couple of weeks, but it's a special event. It's not something that is ever present from the day they're born. And so, you know, families of color deal with it every single day, so. Thank you. Yeah, that was also mentioned in the chat with Alana's group. Xiao Ying. <clears throat> Hello, I come from Taiwan. I just came to the States last year. So uh, what I guess about the second question is the same, it's very similar as you talk about. I guess that uh, people that uh, parents, they don't want to talk about racial issue because they don't really understand. Uh, I went to a wedding four or five years ago in Florida and the bride and the bridegroom, they're both white and there are no people, all of the attendants, they are white people. So I guess people tend to gathering with people in the same race. And also I come from Taiwan, Taiwanese people are 97 percentage, Taiwanese people are ethnically Chinese. So in Taiwan, parents don't talk about race as well. Um, the first time I came to the States, I went to Walgreens. I want to buy some skincare product. I want to buy some makeup. And I saw some foundations. They are all different colors. And it really surprised me because in Taiwan, when we learn how to paint the color pen, the skin color is only one color, beige mm -hmm. color. So it's mm -hmm. kind of a cultural shock for me. So I think I can understand why those parents, they don't want I, I, I don't think I don't think that they don't want to talk. They just never think about it. Thank you. And our last, let's have our last um, comments from Nandita. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Um, so um, in my group, I think um, Saeed brought up a really good point, which was that I think um, especially people of color, like um, we kind of bounce back really easily. Like we somehow love our country so much, even though it's not very kind to us in really any aspect. And I think a lot of that is because we've grown up this way. Like we've grown up seeing people around us, like our close family and friends, and even ourselves being so hurt by the system that we just have to grow up with this warped reality of like what a good community looks like. And I just thought that was really interesting because um, it's kind of like Stockholm syndrome where like mm. you just kind of, you're like, I love this place so much, but it's like, it's not actually a functional system. Mm. Um, so yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for your thoughts and your comments. Really appreciate it. And thank you again to the facilitators for facilitating our discussion. Um, I would like to share a little bit now. Um, I'll bring up some slides here. And so I wanted to share with you some highlights from the research, a research paper that I discovered when I was trying to learn this for as a classroom educator and as a parent of three young girls in the US. Um, and I'm gonna share with you some highlights and, and all of the resources that I've talked about as well as this slideshow, I'll share with you at the very end. And I encourage everyone to jump in and dive into this, this paper. It's a paper put out by a doctoral student, Erin Winkler. Well, she is now has her PhD, um, but it's looking at how young children learn race. So the, the things that I'm about to share with you are all taken from this research paper. Um, the first thing that uh, she shares is that children learn 
and conform to the broader and social norms of their communities and societies. So this has come up a lot tonight. People have sort of found their way through these conversations to some of the, the what the research has actually found. And one of those things is the notion that research has disproved the popular belief that children only have racial biases if they are directly taught to do so. It's actually not always the case that, their, that children's racial beliefs are only related to those of their parents. So this isn't saying that parents are not passing down racist beliefs, but it's saying that children are motivated to learn and conform to the broader cultural and social norms of their communities and in their societies. So they gather information from a really broad range of sources, not just their families, and they actively construct their own beliefs from the information that they're absorbing from the world around them. And as many people have pointed out tonight, we know that children do see color. They're not colorblind. And in fact, in a study that followed approximately 200 black and white children from the ages of six months to nine, six months to six years, they found that infants were able to non-verbally categorize unfamiliar adults by their skin type. So we do know that from a very young age, children do see race, they do see color. Um, but what they found, uh, so the, the notion that children are colorblind is actually scientifically false. The second thing that Winkler highlights in this research article is another thing that, uh, that many of you said in our whole group share and in the chat. Even if adults do not explicitly mention or endorse ideas about race, children notice patterns in their environment and they make inferences about differences between groups. So the environment that young children are in teach them which categories are the most important. So even if you, no one around them is explicitly mentioning it or endorsing it, they learn through observation. And they infer from the patterns that they're seeing that something must be meaningful between the inherent, that, and it must be meaningful and that it's inherent between these two groups. These differences are inherent and meaningful between the two groups. That's what they're picking up. And although children are attaching meaning to race without adults directly telling them, it's, it's not random what they're picking up. Those, the things that they're attaching about people are not random. The, the connections that they're making are subtle and not so subtle messages that they're picking up. And here in the United States, children are picking up on the ways in which whiteness is normalized and it's privileged. And consciously or unconsciously, white middle-class culture in particular is presented as a norm and the standard. And it's presented as the norm and the standard in terms of appearance, beauty, language, cultural practices, food, the message is permeating the daily lives of our children. And as we saw from that video earlier, it's coming from a number of different places. So it's coming from books, children's movies, television, music, our school curriculums, and of course the adults around us. So the question becomes, what should caregivers do? What should the adults that are in our children's lives do? And this is why to me, uh, this, this, this idea that children are picking it up, not just from what's explicitly told by the adults in their lives, but from the whole environment around them, it, it gives us another reason that we should all be, why we should all be invested, right? We are all contributing to this. Or we are all either dismantling it or contributing it to it in some way um, as, as we move and breathe uh, this environment around us. So, one of the first things we want to do is to talk about race. Someone mentioned a little bit earlier that adults are often silent on the issue of race and prejudice and, and inequality. And you know, as they mentioned, it's because they're not comfortable about it. Um, and sometimes we give no information 
or inaccurate information because we ourselves do not fully understand how racism works and why racial inequality exists in our society, particularly so many years after the civil rights movement. And one of the things we have to remember is that we ourselves as adults have been taking in the subtle and not so subtle messaging of cultural racism on a daily basis. So we're all sort of swimming around in it. And researchers have found that parents of very young children that talk, they'll, they'll often talk very freely about gender, but they won't talk as freely about race. And as some, another one of the youth mentioned, the silence doesn't keep the children from noticing race, nor does it keep them from developing racial biases and prejudices. It actually just keeps them from talking about it. And children who have been silenced often enough learn not to talk about race publicly. And their questions don't go away, they just go unasked. And so we don't wanna be shushing our children. We don't wanna be shutting down conversations. We want to educate ourselves and do the internal work and emotional work that will allow us to engage with our children in open, honest, frequent, and age appropriate conversations about race. And research has shown that these kinds of conversations are actually associated with lower levels of bias in children. So we're not putting ideas into their heads. We're actually helping to dismantle prevalent stereotypes that go remain that remain unchanged when we don't have these open conversations. The other thing is that when name calling or discrimination happens at schools, and then it goes either unnoticed or unchecked and undiscussed by adults, children infer that that behavior is acceptable and that it's widely accepted, that this is okay. So researchers have found that addressing issues of race and racism are important and they're certainly important in our classrooms, even and perhaps especially if there is little to no racial or ethnic diversity in the classroom in that, of that area. Children are picking up the ideas and the less actual meaningful contact that they have with people from other racial groups besides their own, the more likely they're going to be to retain those higher levels of prejudice. So we want to talk to them about race explicitly, frequently, openly, and honestly. The second thing we want to do is we want to encourage complex thinking. So studies have shown that children, uh, teaching young children to think more in more complex ways can be an effective way in reducing prejudice. And I think it was Kristen that had talked a little bit about this earlier and maybe Leslie as well, that when children are taught to pay attention to the multiple attributes of a person, and not just their race, researchers found that reduced levels of bias were shown. So in addition to giving accurate information about race and racism, we should also focus on teaching how children how to think critically and to see the multiple attributes of people. A third thing that the researchers found was that we want to empower children to act and make change. Perhaps the most important thing we can do is to provide them with ideas about how to fight against the continuing racial inequities we find in our society. And we want them to actively seek out anti-race racist role models. We wanna help them do this in our communities, in our society. And we want to expose them to people that are engaged in this work. We want to show them that people are facing these problems and our society is facing them. And organizations like this one are investing in making positive change. And we, we do this so that children have a sense of hope and they know that there are, there is, Things are action oriented. We can change through action. Um, 
I know that response to racism also really encourages all of us to take some further steps. I, I wanted to share just a little bit more about some things that you could potentially just do in your homes. If you're a classroom teacher, you might do this. I thought aunts, uncles, grandparents that, that sort of are very active and engaged with their families could take this on. And if you are not uh, interacting with children, most certainly you could even just do this for yourself in your own home. But the idea is around diversity auditing. And I'll share with you the blog um, and the resources that I got this from, but it's a really powerful tool. And it's a wonderful way of being very explicit and collecting data about what's real and what's not. So some examples of auditing questions. So the example that this person did was looking at books. So take a look, they, would, they picked 25 books off of their shelf, off of their children's bookshelf, as an example. If you're a teacher, it's your classroom library. And they asked themselves, um, they took actually very explicit data around how many people of color do you see? Um, what races of people do you not see in these books? How are different races shown in these picture books? Because it's not just a matter of, for example, when we're trying to help determine, uh, expose children to diversity, it's not just what that they see the races, it's that the races are portrayed in a very wide range of representations. Um, and then you wanna kind of look at what roles um, do, what roles are certain races of people most often taking on in these picture books and what commonalities do you notice? So this was, I think a very power, and then when you collect all of your data, you kind of determine the messages. What are all the messages that your, these books or the movies that you watch or whatever it is that you're evaluating what messages are they sending about race to the children that you're um, that are under your care? And I thought it was very powerful. Um, a Montessori school did this with with every aspect of um, their classroom, and then they asked the parents to to think of other things, uh, other areas other than books that they felt could help to that they could audit. So they looked at their toys. They looked at audiobooks and podcasts. What kind of puzzles were children exposed to? When it came to artwork, um, it was interesting. Chow Ying, Ying was talking about um, how they they only had one color pencil. You know, with artwork, there are multicolored packs of crayons. So, do you have those in your home? Are they in the classroom where children have a, a really wide range of skin colors that they could? a palette that they could be working with. What kind of food um, are people, children exposed to? Clothing, parents said um, they looked at their dress up get, um, clothing. Parents also said they looked at board games, instruments, music, uh, and entertainment. What sort of games and videos were they exposed to? And of course, I think those of us in this work, um, are we again want to look at all the dimensions of things. So when we're looking at the representations that we have in our homes and in our classrooms, in our communities, in our libraries, you know, what races are represented? What about gender? What about things around same sex parenting? What about things on transgender? We can look at these things through these different lenses, adoption, disabilities, um, children with complex health concerns, culture and religion, houselessness, refugees and immigrants. There are, there are all these facets that we could be looking at to, to equip ourselves to, to expose our children to the humanity and the wide range of experiences in the world. So for um, next month, I thought one thing that we could all do is encourage each of us to take a step. One would be to take conduct a diversity audit whether it be of the toys in your home, depending on the age of your children, the books in your home. If you're a teacher, I definitely recommend um, doing this with your classroom library. In fact, I'm gonna share Ow. in the resources, I'll share a blog in which the teacher had the whole class do it. And I think that's a fantastic idea. I think one could sit with their own child. This is a one way to open up a dialogue around race. If your child is a little bit older, you could sit with your child and pull out 
those random set of books and talk to them. You know, what do we see here in our bookshelf here at home? What do we see? What do we mostly, what kind of picture books do we mostly read? And what are they mostly about? You could take this slideshow, you can copy it and revise it and make it better and present your learning to a group of friends or colleagues. Um, that this research article I read was really, really impactful and had was, was so full of um, information that I think that alone could just be a discussion group for a PTO, um, a PTO group or parents in a, that are trying to be active and engaged in this. Uh, you could also explore researchers, research, resources that were shared in this presentation and find something meaningful to post or to share. It doesn't have to um, necessarily be something that you know a lot about, but if you think it's important for others to know about, research it and share it. So I wanted to be sure to give you the, um, all of these resources here. Let me stop sharing. I'll put it in the chat. Oops, sorry. Hold on, my computer's super slow. Okay, so I'll share in the chat a, a Google Doc. And this Google Doc basically has everything that was that we talked about tonight. And further things that you might want to explore. Um, I'm big into literacy. So some of the things that I share are blogs about people who are actively looking for newly published materials and critiquing it and sharing its representation value. Um, one book, uh, I share a couple of websites about where you can find di diverse books. Um, and uh, I also share um, some books about how to talk about race with children. A wonderful book um, is called, this book is, is anti-racist. And that's a wonderful thing for older and middle school kids to, uh, as a resource to share as a parent. So that's what I had for you. Um, I think, were there any um, comments or questions? We're coming up on the hour, so I think I kind of, Tried to skip around a bit. All right, I think John had a poll for us. We're gonna take a poll and then Terry will close this out. Thank you so much, Catherine, for all of the insights and the work that you put into tonight's presentations, very, very valuable. So we really appreciate it. Thank My you pleasure. So very thank much, you. Catherine. Thank you to the facilitators thank again. You. And thank you for everyone for the insights. They were already here. Everyone kind of had it all, we, but the research showed is what our intuition is telling us. So we're also our, our own guides. Um, really, Catherine, um, the key that I'm getting is the key to all of this and the key to progress is education, to take responsibility for your education, to take responsibility for the education of the people in your network, uh, your children, and that's how we'll have a future for this country. And yeah. we'll save ourselves. That's right. And Sarah and Thank Zoe, so much, I Catherine. think, yeah, Sarah and Zoe like kind of nailed it, you know, with the, the notion of having conversations, being open and talking about it. Yeah. Great. We're glad you learned new things and heard different perspectives tonight. So John, are you gonna put up the things to be aware of that are coming up? Yes, I am. 
Perfect. Please bear with me for a second. Okay. Don't go away, you guys. Just a couple more minutes. So this is uh, Genocide Awareness and Prevention Month. And so on the screen here, which I think will be emailed to you or put in the chat are some things you can do to uh, educate yourself and to uh, participate in different activities going on this month. The uh, second thing is the LO City Council meets tomorrow uh, evening at 5.30 and they will be um, voting on ordinance 2868, which pertains to establishing a DEI advisory board. So if you would like to submit a comment about uh, in support of uh, that ordinance, you can do so by noon tomorrow and the email address is on here at the city recorder. Um, uh, the um, community policing work that is going on right now is uh, in full force. They had the community kickoff and now they're doing focus groups which are starting this week. So if you signed up to participate, thank you so much. Um, if you did not sign up to participate, we hope you will take the survey and that will be released on April 7th. And there's a link um, that you'll be able to go to, to to find the survey when that's released. Um, on Monday, this coming Monday, April 12th at 7 p.m. at Respond to Racism uh, on our Instagram page, there'll be Instagram live with um, special guest Emily So. So please uh, participate on that. I think that's being led by Bruce Poinsett. Um, we are having a school board candidate forum. We think it's really important for the community to hear from the folks that are running for school board. We're hosting this with the Lake Oswego Sustainability Network, and you need to register to attend. It'll be a Zoom webinar. If for some reason you cannot attend, we will post it on uh, YouTube. And it is on Tuesday, April 27th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Then another important event coming up, and we have to thank Pat again for this. Um, there is a documentary called Samurai in the Oregon Sky, and we're partnering with the Lake Oswego Library to bring this documentary to the community, and then we'll have a discussion following the showing of it, virtually, of course, um, with the filmmaker, Ileana Soul. And it's a beautiful uh, documentary. I got a chance to see it, and um, it's very interesting and um, a lot of information that you may not have known about, about um, the bombing of the U.S. mainland during World War II, and but most importantly about um, healing and um, understanding, and I'm, I don't want to do a spoiler, so join us. Okay, um, if you like to um, or have experience with grants, we'd love to hear from you, and there's information about that, and Mark your calendar for June 19th at 4.30 p.m. There'll be more coming, but we're having a Juneteenth celebration. Um, we're partnering with the library and with the Lake Oswego Parks Department, and it should be great. And then um, there's different resources here available to people who might need it. The Racial Equity Support Line, the Stop AAPI Hate Reporting Center. Um, and so if if you have an experience and we encourage you to report uh, any hate crime or experiences. So thank you. So Willie, I think it's you or Pat. Hey, Terry, if I could just say something, we sent this out in an email yesterday. Cool, thank you. So you all have this. Willie? Your mic is off. Oh, there okay. You Thank you for being with us tonight. I hope that you heard something um, that was new or something that um, affirmed something that you believed in. But, and maybe you might have met a new friend. At any rate, have a wonderful evening. We thank you so much for your support and for being here. And I thank our young facilitators. We have youth that rocks. So thank you, thank you, thank you for everything. And 
with that, good night. See you next month.